Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today we'll be discussing how to achieve more effective condition monitoring with Inspection 2.0. This presentation provides an example of the type of material cover in Noria's machinery lubrication and oil analysis training courses, which are offered publicly, privately, and online. At any time during the presentation, you may submit questions in the Q&A window. If you don't receive an immediate answer, a Noria consultant will respond via email after the presentation. As part of our mission to make the world better through lubrication-enabled reliability, we have included a list of resources you may find helpful. Now I'll turn things over to our speaker, Noria's Jim Fitch. Thank you, Jason, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jim Fitch. I'm the CEO of Nori Corporation. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a better understanding of Noria and what we do. Noria is known as the world leader in education and consulting for machinery lubrication and oil analysis. The material presented today comes from our course material and is merely a brief snippet of our overall library. We deliver this training in many different ways, including public courses each month in major cities around the, around the world, private on-site courses for some of our largest customers, as well as online. Today's discussion will focus on machine and lubricant inspection techniques, in particular, deploying Inspection 2.0 as a condition monitoring strategy for early fault detection. At Nori, we believe there's been a need for radical reinvention of the whole concept of inspection. There's little to do with conventional practices of doing daily machine rounds. Instead, with Inspection 2.0, you don't just look at a bearing, seal, coupling, or pump. Instead, you examine these components with a keen and probing eye. Inspection 2.0 is intense and purposeful. For more information on Inspection 2.0, consult the last three issues of Machinery Lubrication Magazine for articles on the subject by me. So now let's get started with our course. So let's begin by looking at the uh, condition monitoring options or strategies uh, specifically for, for lubricants. And so this, uh, this slide uh, presents four options, and they're uh, arranged by periodicity or the frequency of, of inspection, we could say, or analysis. Uh, on the left, uh, we'll start with what is called unattended real-time uh, sensors. We can just call this category real-time uh, monitoring. So it's a technology-intensive method. So we have to have sensors that uh, can uh, continuously collect data, such as on viscosity or uh, contaminant levels like moisture and particles or chemistry of the oil, and can alarm when these conditions become abnormal. So there's in the range of you know, 50 to maybe 75 sensors on the market today. Many of them are quite expensive uh, that can provide this, this capability. Uh, the next one is daily analysis. This is non-instrument field inspection. So this is the main subject of our uh, webinar today. And this is the uh, frequent examination of sight glasses, magnetic plugs, and other inspection points using sensory uh, techniques. So it's only... It's, it's almost as uh, frequent as real-time because it's daily uh, and allows us to, in, in essence, kind of do uh, oil analysis every time we walk by the machine. So we look at a sight glass, we can do sight glass oil analysis. Uh, and so there, because of that periodicity or that frequency of inspection and uh, gathering information on the, on the machine and the oil, has some real advantages over other techniques. Uh, the next is what we call routine analysis. So here we have portable field instruments and test kits. Some of these come in little, uh, uh, you know, cases and so forth, the laboratory in a box sort of thing. And uh, we can bring these to the machine, maybe actually, uh, 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 you know, plug them into the machine or attach them to the machine where a, a sip of a well is, comes into a, a, a sensor module or something or other, and uh, on, you know, on uh, machine inspection or analysis is done, and uh, then you go on to the, the next machine and so forth. So this is rarely done daily. This might be done weekly for critical machines. It might be done monthly. 
uh, and it is often quite expensive depending on what's in that, uh, that kit. Uh, and then the last one is periodic oil analysis, and this is one we're most familiar with is laboratory analysis. We pull samples in, uh, in bottles from our machine that are representative of what's going on in the machine at that moment. Uh, then we uh, forward those samples to uh, either an in-house laboratory or an outside commercial laboratory for analysis. So, uh, you know, we have to be able to see the sample in order to analyze it and find faults clearly. Uh, so these four ways are really the options that, uh, that we have, and only one involves uh, a laboratory. So you don't have to view oil analysis as being laboratory analysis. Later on in this webinar, I'll talk to you about how we can unify, bring all these methods together into an overall overarching uh, condition monitoring strategy. So what we're looking for is to achieve reliability at the lowest possible cost. Doing only laboratory analysis may not achieve that, may not enable the highest level of reliability because of the less frequent, uh, 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 frequently sampled or pulled, say monthly or bimonthly or even quarterly, uh, and uh, it also could be uh, more expensive. So we're looking at, uh, again, reliability at the lowest possible uh, cost. So we're trying to optimize, we're not trying to maximize, and in order to optimize, uh, we need to bring in some of these other methods, in particular inspection. Why inspection 2.0 as a condition monitoring strategy? Well, there's many uh, uh, good reasons. And uh, many of these represent really low-hanging fruit for a lot of organizations. Uh, you know, most people are doing inspection out there, but often uh, these companies are just going down a checklist or just going through the motions, very cursory or superficial. That's not what Inspection 2.0 is about. So uh, it's easy and convenient to use, inexpensive, uh, and has a TPM, uh, TPM emphasis, meaning uh, total productive maintenance. Uh, it, uh, in particular, autonomous maintenance, where maintenance is done uh, all the time. It's operator-driven. Uh, you know, it's, it, it leverages the concept that reliability is everyone's responsibility. It's not just the responsibility of the maintenance technician, the millwright, the, uh, you know, the uh, repairman, or uh, it's everyone's responsibility. There's more emphasis uh, on examination skills, the sensory skills that are available to everyone that's near the machine, and less emphasis on sensors and technology and software and, anal and complex algorithms and analytical methods. Uh, it's looking for on-the-fly detections of what, a detection of whatever, a fault or a root cause, uh, and this can be done uh, very quickly with, when the skills are there and the motivation is there. It can be done daily, it can be done hourly, uh, or whenever the, the machine is, is available for inspection. Uh, one of the biggest opportunities is the root cause uh, orientation or emphasis. It's more proactive uh, maintenance uh, uh, emphasis as opposed to predictive maintenance and certainly not breakdown or reactive maintenance. Uh, it is uh, it, it's looking for faults in their incipient stage, their early detection uh, stage, as opposed to advanced faults where you have an impen impending or precipitous failure uh, condition. We're not just trying to, to, to achieve a just-in-time save. We're looking for longer PF intervals. We'll talk some more about the PF uh, interval and the lead time and the ability to, to conveniently schedule remediation uh, a little bit later. Uh, it has a, it, there's a high uh, residual RUL. RUL stands for remaining useful life. When we have an issue or a fault, uh, we don't want the machine just to have, you know, moments, days, or, or hours or days of remaining useful life. We want a lot of remaining useful life. So there's an emphasis on that. Less downtime, fewer major repairs, more uh, preemptive adjustments as opposed to downtime uh, repair type uh, uh, responses. Certainly less collateral damage. So let's do an inspection right now. Here is a, uh, a tank uh, with the, the hatch open, 
and uh, you can look inside the tank. You can see the oil, the walls of the tank, the surface of the tank, external surface of the tank. Uh, can you find the 10 reportable conditions? Let's so say you're doing an inspection of this tank, and uh, uh, you're asked to report any abnormalities. Uh, can you find the 10 reportable conditions that are visible here? Only five conditions would have been alerts from an oil analysis lab, probably more like three, but no more than five. How many alerts do you think would actually be, have been reported by a typical inspector? Maybe one, two, maybe none? Inspection 2.0 requires uh, skill, it requires training, it requires an understanding requires motivation, it requires taking the time to look at something and identify what uh, varies from normal, what represents a incipient or early stage problem, a root cause, and uh, detailing that and uh, reporting that. So uh, take a look at this, uh, this tank and see if you can find the 10 reportable conditions. So, so inspection 2.0 is a little bit like fishing. It's like fishing for faults. And we all know, those of us that, uh, that uh, go out and do some fishing once in a while, there's, uh, there's uh, something to it. It's not always that easy. So I've kind of broken it down into to four steps, the four steps to catching more fish and bigger fish. So when I go out fishing, I do some fly fishing. Uh, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to have a good experience. I want to be successful, more fish and bigger fish. So let's take a look at these four steps. The first is fishing frequently. That makes sense. Uh, you can't catch a fish unless your hook's in the water. Uh, you can't be you know, watching TV or at a ball game or mowing the lawn and catch fish. We've got to go out to where the fish are and, uh, and, and uh, throw our hook in the water. Second step is we've got to know where the fish are. So, you know, fish tend to uh, concentrate in certain areas depending on the type of fish and the place that we're fishing. So we may uh, have a locator, an electronic device that can uh, help us identify where uh, these fish are concentrated. Maybe we have uh, experience in, in this uh, uh, lake or the stream and know where the uh, proven fisheries are, where they concentrate, or we, maybe we just have a, the skill of being able to read the water. Then thirdly, we need to have the right tools, the right methods, rods, lines, hooks, flies, lures, bait. We're trying to, to coax that fish. We're trying to convince that fish like a magician that what we throw in the water is something that they want and they're going to go after. And so we have to, we have, to have something that is convincing that uh, – does, in, in essence, kind of trick them in a sense. So we have to have uh, proper tackle. And finally, we have to have skills. Uh, maybe we've learned from a, a master, a friend, a, a guide, or trial and error through uh, uh, continuous and, and frequent uh, uh, practice. Unlike fishing with inspection, we're looking for more faults and we're looking for earlier faults. Uh, and there's four very similar steps to doing this. So the first is, just like fishing, uh, frequency is key. We need to be uh, out there looking for faults. We're, we need to have uh, inspection vigilance. Uh, and uh, so inspect conditions frequently. Deploy the penetrating one-minute daily inspection technique or however often you can possibly get in front of the machine uh, to peer into the machine and do the, do the inspection. Then we need to know where uh, to inspect. So we need to have an understanding of where these kind of uh, fault-wise inspection zones, these inspection points uh, are. And we can do this but in part by understanding uh, what we're looking for, the faults and the root causes that we're looking for. If we know what we're looking for, then we can kind of work backwards to identify where they might reveal themselves through an inspection uh, there. Then the third step is to use proper inspection aids, tools, and methods. You know, we certainly want to use our, our senses, but we can also use some other methods uh, as well. We'll talk some more about these, but uh, 
uh, one important method is an inspection window. You know, machines are like, uh, you know, exoskeletons. They're plate steel. We hit, It's hard to see what's going on in the inside of the machine standing on the outside of the machine. So if we can provide a view window or a window that would enable us to peer into the machine to examine and inspect certain things that are important, visual oil analysis. Uh, and then there are some inspection aids that help uh, reveal certain things about the, the insides of the machines and the oil that is moving around inside of the machines that it, are kind of bathing the frictional surfaces and making contact with uh, you know, distant zones within the machines that may be important to us. And then finally, we need to uh, uh, step forward here to inspect skillfully. We need to, we need to learn from, uh, say, a master or someone that has uh, acquired these skills uh, certainly, uh, you know, practice is important to this. Training is important to this, and uh, you know, we need to have that uh, that keen ability of seeing, touching, hearing, smelling, uh, and understanding what these things mean, and where to look, and being able to terp interpret these uh, uh, observed conditions in terms of what it means from the standpoint of machine health and lubricant health. Condition monitoring has uh, time domains relating to uh, machine failure. Uh, we can break these up into three uh, domains. The first is proactive, the proactive domain, which is, which is driven by root causes such as contamination, alignment unbalance, you know, uh, fastener looseness, and just general poor lubrication. Uh, so this relates to what is occurring before the inception of failure. The predictive domain uh, relates to failure symptoms like the generation or production of wear debris, uh, abnormal vibration, noise, heat, and these sorts of things. So that's the predictive domain. And then the pro, uh, protective domain relates to uh, controlling the consequences of failure so that we don't have uh, collateral damage or uh, uh, huge loss of production or even human life. So we have what we call the intervals of, of failure in progress. The most common is the PF interval, but let me start with what we call the RI interval. The R stands for uh, root cause inception, so this is the presence of a root cause condition, uh, and R and I being the, the inception of, of failure, so that time interval between the presence of a root cause and the beginning of machine degradation, for instance, uh, is the R RI interval. The IF interval is the uh, failure development period. So this is the point of when failure starts, the inception of failure, and then F being the functional uh, failure when the machine is basically inoperative. Uh, the IP uh, interval is the interval uh, is the failure elapsed time. So this is the point at which the failure has uh, started, I, uh, and P is the point at which it is uh, the first point of detection. Many fa failures are so, uh, you know, kind of incipient. They're so uh, hard to detect. The signal generated from the failure is so weak that uh, it takes maybe some time before uh, the, the signal uh, build to the point of detection, so that that uh, that failure lapse time is the time uh, between the inception of failure and when it's first detected. Again, the most common interval here is the PF interval, and this is the the failure lead time, P being the point of detection. So maybe we're doing uh, vibration analysis or wear debris analysis. Maybe we're looking at a sight glass and seeing a color change or uh, where debris collected on a, a magnetic plug or something, and then F being the functional failure. So that interval is the PF interval. So obviously we're trying to catch the failure as early stage as possible, and we want that PF interval to be as long as possible. So how do we link the inspection interval uh, to the PF interval? The PF interval is influenced by the nature of individual failure modes and the condition monitoring uh, strategy. The PF interval is a theoretical concept. 
that has useful application but nevertheless is rarely applied in the real world. This is because the real world comes with a many variable events. Uh, this makes the condition monitoring strategy at a frequency of one half the PS interval uh, impractical. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the conditions that, uh, that cause this. One is and our machines have uh, multiple components uh, uh, on a single machine or drive train. Uh, each of these components have the, their own unique PF uh, tendency. Uh, there are also many different failure modes for any given component. And these different failure modes come with their own different frequency and detection uh, uh, tendency or ability. Uh, machines have you know, maybe there may be multiple machines that are made exactly the same, but they are exposed to different duty cycles, speeds, loads, shock, temperatures, or just general operating conditions. All of those influence the PF interval. Uh, the remaining useful life of the machine. Some machines are new. Some machines are older. Uh, and so the, the, for any given failure mode, the, the PF interval shrinks as the machine ages. That can't be you know, avoided. And then, of course, our failure detection methodology and effectiveness varies depending on uh, the machine and the, uh, and the failure mode. The ability to actually... Uh, detect that, that P or that point of, uh, of failure uh, in initiation uh, is going to vary. Early detection means frequent detection. Frequent detection means frequent inspection. Uh, so how do we do this? Well, one is by continuous human uh, sensory surveillance. Uh, surveillance that is root cause intensive. Surveillance that is weak signal uh, intensive, using a trained ear, the ability to hear the weak signal, the pin drop signal, and by lowering the noise threshold so that signal is, is more visible and, and more detectable to us, a high signal to noise uh, detection methodology. We'll talk some more about that. Uh, knowing what the critical few failure modes, that if you were to rank your failure modes, how would you rank them, and what are the high, highly ranked failure modes, and how are we going to use inspection to detect those failure modes? Align the inspection strategy to these failure modes uh, and have a kind of a mastery of method. So where are we going to look for these failure modes? How are we, through inspection, going to know that they exist? So we're looking for a broad or early detection point so we have a kind of a wide detection uh, window. You can see that in this illustration as uh, at the point on the left where we see the blue uh, P there, uh, that's an early de detection point. That, that's where the, the signal is weak and we're detecting or we're inspecting very frequently. We aren't inspecting, inspecting frequently and we're not using good methodology where we can't, uh, uh, where that, that signal is not revealed to us until it's a very strong signal. Then we're all the way to the right with the red P there, and we can see that the remaining useful life at that point is very short uh, and gives us very uh, few options in terms of how do we respond to that compared to the blue P on the left where we have a lot of remaining useful life and we can schedule a repair or correction more at our convenience. Inspection 2.0 requires a uh, a strategy of optimization, working smart. Uh, we want to emphasize the things that are most important. We want to align inspection strategy to risk rank failure modes. And I've already talked about this a little bit. Uh, start by ranking the failure modes based on probability and consequence of failure. This is also known as the definition of risk. What is the probability of failure? and what are the consequences of failure. Next, define one or more inspection fault detectors for each of these highly ranked failure modes. So m many of you have heard of the Pareto principle, also, also known as the 80-20 uh, uh, rule. 20% 20 of all the possible causes of failure uh, are responsible for 80% of the occurrences of failure. So it's 20% of the causes is 
we might refer to those as the critical few. It could be particle contamination, moisture contamination, uh, you know, wrong or degraded lubricant, misalignment, these sorts of things. We want to focus our ins inspection strategy and our condition monitoring strategy on the critical uh, few. Some example inspection fault detectors that might be aligned and associated with fault modes could be heat, uh, oil color and clarity, uh, the color of smoke, say from an engine, uh, leakage, uh, machine sing song or audible uh, symptoms uh, and conditions there, well level changes, sight glass uh, fouling, these sorts of things. So again, we want to optimize. We don't want to inspect everything. Uh, we want to focus the inspection on the rank failure modes that we might expect to see. So RCM refers to something that's called the net PF interval. The net PF interval is the, uh, the PF interval minus the inspection uh, interval, the times between inspections or condition monitoring. For machines that are, uh, monitor that are not monitored in real time, the PF interval is the minimum interval likely to elapse between the detection of a potential failure or fault and the occurrence of that uh, functional uh, failure. So how do we how do we lengthen that? What are our our strategies uh, for that? Well, one might be to uh, to uh, enable uh, weak signal detection. We've talked about that using better methods, better skills, better tools, these sort of things. Next is uh, to disrupt or mitigate the primary failure agent. Uh, this is. Uh, uh, TPM might refer to this as autonomous maintenance, keeping the oil continuously clean, keeping the machine continuously aligned, and continuously fix little things so they don't become big things. Uh, to deploy Band-Aid fixes uh, where uh, uh, you might add uh, viscosity to an oil or add additives uh, or to, the, to the oil or supplement uh, oil cooling to, uh, to slow down the progress of, of failure. We may derate the machine for a similar, with, a, uh, with a similar purpose to, by reducing load, speed, duty cycle, and so forth. Again, to slow down, mitigate the, uh, the failure progress. Uh, we could avoid machines that have very short RULs uh, and schedule uh, overhauls so that these RULs are extended. So we're not running machine uh, with 20% remaining useful life, because we detected a problem at that point, we'd, ha we'd, we'd by its very nature have a very short PS interval. Or we could just shorten the inspection interval to improve the net PS interval. So that's what we're talking about with uh, uh, with inspection. You know, daily one-minute inspection. We're constantly looking. We're st constantly surveying. We're not just you know, going through the motions, but we're examining, we're studying, we're trying to figure out what might be happening. If we see something that that uh, that looks uh, suspicious, we look further. So this is this is what we're trying to do with inspection 2.0, trying to lengthen that net TF interval. You can see how the remaining useful life or RUL affects the PS interval uh, by looking at this chart. This is a standard RUL chart on the left. You can at the top is 100% remaining useful life, and as the machine ages and wears and so forth, it goes from 100 down to what, what approaches zero. Now the slope of this curve is important because uh, substandard maintenance negligent maintenance, these sorts of things, uh, tends to uh, result in a very steep slope, and we have very rapid progress from 100% RUL to zero. But by applying uh, proactive maintenance, we can flatten out this curve. So proactive maintenance is the eradication of root causes, the rapid, uh, continuous, autonomous detection of root cause conditions, and their, and their extraction, so they, de they don't lead to faults and, and wear and degradation and ultimately failure. So we're trying to take this curve and flatten it out. That's the whole role of, of, of proactive maintenance. Predictive maintenance 
is a strategy of looking down this curve. We're trying to, at any point in time, look and see how much remaining useful life we have if failure progresses as it currently is. So if uh, we're at a 50% point and we're running a test using predicted maintenance, we see that we have 50% of the RUL of the machine's life left. So how does this affect the, the PS interval? Well, if we have uh, machines that are new and, you know, we're applying a, a, an effective proactive maintenance strategy, if we detect a fault, whatever that fault or root cause might be or the fault mode might be, we're going to have uh, a much longer PF interval at our convenience uh, there. You can see, see that. So it would be up towards the top of that curve there. If we're at the end of machine's life and we detect the exact same fault, but it's just at the end of the machine's life, there's so much loss of material, say, in the bearings or gears or pistons or cams or whatever it is, that uh, we really have a very short time uh, uh, window there to respond to that. So we have a very short PF interval as a result. This slide and, and chart shows us how failure detectability technique and failure period periodicity uh, work together to influence the PF interval and to preserve remaining useful life. So if, uh, in this case, our inspection uh, can be done uh, every day, weekly, monthly, bimonthly, quarterly, in our example, we have a, a one-month um, uh, interval uh, there, uh, IF interval, failure development interval is one month. So looking at the top there, the daily inspection strategy uh, gives us different PF intervals depending on our failure detection uh, technique. If we have really good kind of pin drop failure detection technique uh, with a daily strategy uh, with a one month failure development period, we have roughly a 30 day PS interval. On the other hand, if our inspection technique is, is not good, we don't have the skills or the methods, the tools uh, to detect a, an, an incipient condition, even with a daily inspection uh, methodology, we only have a seven-day PF interval. Uh, if we use a weekly strategy, at, uh, even with the best pin drop technique, if we're only looking at it every week, uh, we only have a 25. We have a 25-day uh, interval compared to a 30-day interval if we had used a 30-day uh, uh, or a daily uh, methodology. For a monthly uh, inspection, we are down, now down to an 18-day PF interval, again, using really good inspection technique. If our method is uh, or our, our inspection is done bi-monthly, then we, are, we don't have a PF interval. Uh, we're not seeing this, uh, in this case, uh, the fault in time. The fault begins and the machine fails all within the interval there. Same is true uh, with quarterly. So again, the, 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 the lesson here is we need to have good uh, failure detection technique or inspection technique and frequent inspection period, periodicity. One of the best ways to do inspection 2.0 is to uh, have a strategy, a surveillance strategy of daily OMIs or one-minute uh, inspections. So again, combination of frequent inspection and good detectability, good technique. Uh, so we talk about this in really all of our training. It's a, it's a major kind of uh, core attribute to lubrication uh, excellence. And so here are some different ways you could do this. Temperature, of course, is important. Uh, machines, it's rare for a machine to fail without a temperature event, some sort of temperature excursion or thermal excursion. Oil often changes as a result of, of faults and failures, so they're indicative of faults and failures. Pressure, depending on the, the type of machine, if it's a hydraulic machine, we may see changes in pressure. Uh, the filters, uh, the, the, not only the delta P or the pressure gauge on the filter, but doing filter inspections. Uh, BS and W stands for bottom sediment and water. M most of the things that uh, we don't want in the oil that are in the oil that are indications of problems with the machine, most of these things are heavier than oil. And so they settle and accumulate. If we have a little trap or inspection window, 
talk some more about this. It, it gives us quick visual uh, sight of that, then uh, we can respond quickly. Ventilation, uh, clear and bright inspections of the oil using inspection windows and gauges and sight glasses. Leakage, uh, you know, fluid surface and headspace conditions, so we have to have the ability to actually see within the headspace uh, points of entry places where uh, ingression points, seals, open places that uh, uh, contaminants uh, in the, you know, whatever's floating around or moving around in the environment might enter the oil and, and compromise the oil in the system. Uh, the, the cleanliness, external cleanliness of the machine, uh, sound, spits and sputters, all important to uh, OMIs. The PF interval of most complex industrial machines can vary from milliseconds to decades. Sudden death failures can occur without warning for many reasons. We might associate these with what we call root cause uh, fault bubbles. So we need to focus on the cause of failure and the symptoms or the indications of those causes. Uh, this could be associated with a you know, oil filter rupture that can uh, displace or uh, send a debris field downstream of, uh, of the filter into the high sensitive hydraulic components. It may be associated with uh, oil that is uh, wrong for the machine. Uh, or a severely degraded uh, lubricant, filth, uh, fish bowl conditions, uh, disturbed or mobilized bottom sediment and sludge that uh, uh, again travel into uh, uh, sensitive uh, zones or components within a machine, uh, severe shaft misalignment, stiction, uh, silt lock conditions such as in a hydraulic valve, uh, motion impediment issues. Uh, grease, soap, lock, starvation conditions, say from an auto, auto lube system there. Uh, impaired oil supply, uh, the splash lubricated gearbox and, and so forth. So, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to avoid the, 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 the Humpty Dumpty, the failed bearing that the, the King's men and his horse, and their horses, uh, could not save. And we can use inspection for this. We can use inspection for the earliest possible detection of of these, uh, these so-called fault bubbles. A big part of success with Inspection 2.0, it begins with readying our machine. Uh, so machine readiness means making modifications, kind of accessorizing the machine so that we can inspect and see and recognize the conditions that should be of, of, of importance to us as it relates to root causes and symptoms of faults and, and abnormal wear and health conditions. So there's a lot of things, uh, fortunately, today that we can uh, do uh, to, uh, to aid in uh, these, these inspections. And most of these, or many of these, are shown in this, this simple illustration. These include uh, accessible inspection hatches, uh, definitely sight glasses wherever you can. These could be inline sight glasses. They could be BS and W bowls. They could be oil level sight glasses. Uh, uh, all uh, very important to uh, understanding uh, conditions that uh, are associated with oil, the color of the oil, the the, uh, the air handling ability of the oil, the emulsions uh, that uh, associated with water and other chemicals that have uh, that have invaded uh, the oil. Uh, the, uh, we may want to have debris traps or uh, magnetic plugs that are easy to, uh, to uh, inspect. Uh, expanded metal view guards so that we can see rotating parts and maybe points of leakage. Uh, temperature gauges, really the more temperature gauges we can install on a machine, particularly circulating machines, the better downstream of the work end of the equipment. So if, if something is happening on a bearing or a gear and the well is flowing through those frictional zones where we have, say, abnormal wear or friction, heat, uh, you know, the temperature of the oil is going to change, and we need to be able to quickly uh, recognize that. Same is true with flow. You know, flow is important, uh, and when uh, flow changes due to back pressure or 
uh, leakage or whatever, we need to be able to recognize that. And so installing flow meters in the correct places may be very helpful. I've already mentioned uh, sight glass oil analysis. This is, uh, you know, you, you use your eyes to inspect the oil, and you uh, every time you're walking by the sight glass, you can inspect the oil. Uh, there's actually an article I wrote a while back you'll find on uh, Noria's uh, website, machinerylubrication.com, called Sight Glass Oil Analysis. So it's, it's, a, it's an important method, but uh, a lot of times our machines are not, uh, are not ready for this. We may have an oil level gauge, but can't really see all that we need to see in the way that we need to see it. So we need to think about the strategy, where, where we need sight glasses and how the sight glasses, glasses are going to uh, help us reveal certain information of, about the oil, such as you know, not only changes in oil level, but foaming and color and turbidity and and emulsions that are there, sediment and these sorts of things. So here are some examples of uh, of sight glasses, and uh, you know, take a look at your machine, see how your machine today is is accessorized for the windows and the easy inspection of, of, of these conditions, in, including BS and W, bottom sediment water, which, which we've talked about, because the presence of BS and W is an indication of, of a variety of different uh, problems. And when we don't have BS and W in a properly fitted BS and W bowl, there's a whole bunch of things that could be going wrong. I could think of about 25 of them, 25 things that could be going wrong with our machine and our oil uh, that are not going wrong with our machine or oil simply because our BS and W bowl is clear and bright. There's no sediment or accumulation there. You'll also see an article at machinerylubrication.com called zone inspections. So zone inspections are, are really a great strategy for early problem detection. There are three uh, zones in a typical you know, sump or, or, or reservoir. Uh, the, the top zone is what we call the level foam and deposits uh, zone. So level is just like it sounds. We need to know that we have the correct oil level. And a lot of machines have very sensitive uh, oil levels, meaning that slight changes in oil level can uh, result in, in uh, you know, sharp problems uh, with reliability of the equipment. Then we, you know, foam and, you know, kind of the air handling ability of the oil is, is also uh, visible at, the, at this top uh, L, F, and D zone. And then, of course, deposit deposits are the walls of the machine just above the oil level, uh, things that become uh, uh, insoluble to the oil that, uh, lead to deposits will often show up here kind of as a bathtub ring. So if we have the ability to see, say, through an inspection of the, uh, of the, uh, of the head space through a, a hatch or something, to see the deposits there could be very important to what's also happening elsewhere in the equipment. The, the second zone is what we call the, the oil color and clarity zone, or the C, CNC zone. And, you know, oh, a whole bunch of things change the oil's color and clarity. I've got a list there just to give me an example. And uh, so we need to have some ability to peer into the kind of the moving, working part of uh, the sump or reservoir to understand, uh, you know, how the color and clarity has, have changed compared to that of, say, of new oil. And then the last zone, we've already talked a lot about the bottom set up and sediment and waters on the BS and W. And, you know, again, the things that can uh, lead to uh, BS and W uh, uh, conditions with uh, with our sight glass are, are kind of listed there. These are important. We need to have the ability to see this quickly so that we can respond to it quickly as well. This slide shows us three examples of problems that are detected or could be detected using zone inspections. So on the left side there, we've got uh, a, a ruptured filter. So we've got a, a, a circulating system. Uh, it's a filter that's full of debris and dirt and so forth. Maybe it needed to be changed, but it didn't get changed, and it weakened due to fatigue or whatever. And so the oil uh, eventually uh, ruptures that filter, and 
you know, say months of debris that was in the filter becomes discharged downstream of the filter uh, and then begins to accumulate in the sump. So we really can't see this very well, usually from the, you know, typical sight glasses, including in, in this example a, a, a sight glass at the center line of the well level. But we can see it where if we had a BS and W bowl at the bottom. So you can see some of the sediment and debris start to accumulate there. So if we're doing uh, frequent daily inspections and we see that there, then we can respond and, and, and you know, stop the machine and correct that con uh, condition, flush it out or whatever it needs to be. In the center here we have uh, entrained air. So in, unlike sediment, air wants to go up, it rises into the oil. So we may not see it, anything in the BS and W bowl. Let's say our say our the foam inhibitor has been scrubbed out or something or other, and we have a, a or and or a new source of air into the system, and so that air becomes very apparent in the the sight glass at the oil level. Now, if we had a columnar sight glass, that may not be apparent because that columnar may actually pull oil from further down into the sump, not making it visible in the, the column of the sight glass, the oil level sight glass there. And then finally on the right, we have, uh, say, some sort of oil degradation condition, thermal failure, oxidation, you know, some sort of chemical event there. And the oil is getting dark, opaque, uh, turbid, these, these sorts of things. We might be able to see that in, in both of our sight glasses at the, uh, the, the oil level sight glass as well as the BS and W bowl. In addition to our senses, which is what we're going to use most of the time with inspection 2.0, with really good inspection kind of windows, uh, we should uh, we should take advantage of other inspection uh, say translation aids. We could call it. These include heat guns. Heat guns are powerful. Uh, it can uh, identify changes in the kind of the thermal profile of a machine. If we're doing this every day, we understand. Uh, you know, what has been normally in the past, and if there's been a sudden uh, change in our machine, we'll, we'll be able to recognize that. Uh, blotter uh, spot testing, uh, you know, an old method, but a simple method, and it identifies not only changes in color of the oil, but uh, certain insolubles and sediment and things that are, that are floating around the oil that show up very easily and quickly. Uh, in, a, in a blotter spot test. Uh, grease purge traps, you can see that in the bottom right hand corner of this slide. The things that are purged out of grease, we can inspect those say, with our hands to see if there are solids that are there. Uh, we can get a sense of the, the consistency of the grease and the amount of oil that's in the grease. Of course, we can use our eyes and see if there's been a significant change of color of the grease, where there seems to be maybe water mixed in with the grease. Uh, corrosion gauges, these are things that uh, may dangle down into a sump that we can fish out periodically and, and inspect for uh, you know, speckles of, of, of rust or tarnishing. Um, and varnish gauges, kind of similar uh, to that, that we can uh, use to, for uh, inspection. Uh, oil, con uh, oil content gauge for inspection. Well, this is, uh, this is a, something you'll see on our, our website, machinelubrication.com. This is a little device that can be used to uh, identify the amount of oil that, uh, that remains in a, in a grease. Uh, as grease ages, uh, we tend to lose uh, oil content. If we lose too much oil content, uh, the effectiveness of, gr of the grease has diminished considerably. Stethoscopes, this is uh, another acoustic pickup devices can be used. Dipsticks and, you know, what reside on the dipstick, not just at oil level. Uh, viscosity comparators, oil colored gauges, sediment tests, water separability tests, magnetic plugs, boroscopes. You know, the list goes on. There's a lot of different options out there to us. Again, take it. You know, take a, uh, the time to study the, whether the possible uh, uh, root causes and failure modes that are most important to us, and then identify uh, the ways we are going to detect these conditions uh, early on. This may involve the use of an inspection aid as well as modifications to the machine to, to ready the machine for quick uh, detection of these conditions. 
like a lot of things in life, with inspection, you only get out of it what you put into it. I have a dog who loves to play ball. When you throw the ball, this dog is just totally desperate to catch the ball as fast as possible. Search for faults with this much passion. There's a lot of things that relate to this, such as those on the list here. Uh, culture is huge. Uh, you know, an inspection culture. Uh, total productive maintenance is a good place to start to to put programs in place, place to build that culture. Uh, training and inspection skill competency. Uh, the desire to, to, uh, to inspect doesn't mean we have the skills and know-how to, to inspect. So we have to have both desire and, and skills. Uh, stop just looking at bearings, seals, couplings, motors. Start examining them. Study them. You know, hunt for, for issues that uh, need uh, a, a correction or a modification. Celebrate inspection saves. Make it a big deal that uh, you caught something before it led to something more serious. Uh, we've talked about inspection windows and inspection aids. Uh, and then always respond to a flag, an alert. Don't just let it go because that can be habit forming and eventually uh, all the benefits of of inspection and all the things that you might see, uh, we, lo we lose full advantage of. So I mentioned earlier that you know inspection needs to be coupled with other condition monitoring strategies, including just uh, conventional oil analysis and other uh, condition monitoring technologies such as vibration and acoustics and th uh, you know uh, thermography and so forth. But we also can combine it with uh, simple uh, field uh, tests. So here's a, a table that identifies down the left side target properties that could be of interest to us. These, could, these are failure modes and you know, root causes and things like that. How are we going to detect these? If there's you know, uh, some of these failure modes that are common and associated with a particular machine or component type, we need to identify it. And then how are we going to detect an abnormality there or an, a an indication that that failure mode is occurring. So how would we do that with inspection? How might we do that with field, a simple field test? So this table is kind of gets you started with some ideas on how that can be done. Another article you'll see at Machine Relubrication Magazine, uh, machinerelubrication.com, is one that talks about the unification of oil analysis with inspection strategy and other condition monitoring uh, methods. So we've talked about this. And uh, so I kind of go in through, a, in this article, uh, ways to do this. Because you know, oil analysis, that shouldn't stand alone. Inspection shouldn't stand alone. Uh, vibration shouldn't stand alone. We're all working towards uh, common goals, hopefully rolling in the same direction. So there's a need to, to to view these different methods uh, together, and that's what this this article addresses. You know how we how we work together uh, to uh, achieve common uh, objectives uh, here. So this table is one that comes from that article, and down the left side of this are are oil analysis and inspection methods, and across the top uh, are the the root causes and conditions that we hope to find and how we're going to find them and how frequently we're going to find them. So again, think about inspection as being very important, but don't view it as a alone. Make sure we have inspection 2.0 quality and then combine it with other condition monitoring uh, methodologies of, of equal uh, uh, effectiveness. Hopefully at this point it's clear to you what the, uh, what's unique about Inspection 2.0 and how it uh, is different than conventional inspections. And, you know, inspections have been around a long time. And we want inspections because of their simplicity and high frequency to deliver to us the conditions that we can respond to conveniently and even when work orders are required, we want a high percentage of our work orders to be triggered or learned by inspection. But uh, you know, in case you're not clear on what the differences between inspection 2.0 and conventional inspection, here's 
Here's a list. Uh, so it relates to uh, an emphasis on frequency or daily inspection or even more uh, frequent than that. An emphasis on, there's an emphasis on inspection uh, location and uh, aligning the inspection location with what it is we're looking for. Uh, and, and, and there's an emphasis on inspection windows, the ability to peer into the machine and into the oil in the correct locations, uh, aligning the failure modes and the ranking of failure modes to the inspection strategy and the inspection location, the inspection window and the inspection aids and the inspection techniques. Uh, inspections uh, designed to pre, uh, preempt fault bubbles. So we need to know what the at risk, the high risk fault bubbles are. I gave you kind of a, a rough list uh, earlier. How does our inspection strategy relate to those those fault fault bubbles? Emphasis on weak signal detection. The weak signal being the ability to detect the the P of the PF interval as early as possible so that we have a long PF interval and we have the convenience of time. We, we haven't lost a lot of our remaining useful life because we de detected the problem uh, you know, far too late. The use of advanced inspection aids and tools. So we've got a lot of things that are available to us. They don't have to be fancy or expensive or complex. They don't even have to have you know, electronics or anything like that. Uh, but they could they could be very very useful uh, to us, and then finally inspectors that are highly skilled and, and motivated. So uh, you know the old ways of inspecting uh, have changed, and so we we need to uh, you know, modernize our inspection methodology, teach uh, uh, our operators and people that work in and around the machines the uh, the inspection 2.0 ways of doing this. I hope you have learned something today about machine and lubricant inspection techniques that you can apply to your facility or plant uh, and you understand the, the differences between conventional inspection and inspection 2.0. If you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the Q&A window or contact Nora using the information on the screen. We want to help, whether it's answering your questions or visiting your site to begin an assessment. Uh, we want you to be successful. Again, thank you for joining us today, and please remember to send in your requests for the next webinar topic. Thank you, Jim, for that excellent presentation. If you enjoyed today's webinar, visit noria.com for information on Noria's online certification courses or register for our next public training course in your area. You can also bring Noria on-site for personalized private training. To suggest a future webinar topic, simply type it into the Q&A window now. Again, thank you for attending this webinar, and we look forward to you joining us for our next webcast presentation.